hello and welcome back. So what I want to talk to you about today is high voltage linear regulators and the apparent lack of any sort of integrated solutions for this problem. I mean, for most applications, most of the IC manufacturers provide quite a bunch of solutions. But when it comes to linear regulators working above a few hundred volts, well, the market is pretty dry. I mean, I could only find a single IC that is able to provide a variable output voltage above 300 volts. And this IC only comes in a positive voltage version. So there's no negative voltage IC that works at such high voltages. So what I want to start doing today is start working on a linear regulator that can work with voltages of at least 300 volts and which can be built in both a positive voltage and a negative voltage version. So if you're curious, then keep watching. So what are the features of a good linear regulator? Well, its primary function is to provide a good stable output voltage. But other than this, you also want some sort of current limit and also an over temperature limit, both of these being needed so that the component doesn't break if there's some sort of short circuit or some sort of defect on the output. But then other than these features, you also want a low quiescent current and a low minimum load current. And you also want a small output to input minimum voltage. So for most regulators, you will have a voltage defined that ensures correct operation, but which requires a minimum voltage difference between the output and the input. And this last point in particular is where the LR8 is quite lacking, since this component needs at least 12 volts of voltage drop on it to operate correctly. Now, you can build a complete linear regulator from discrete components. I actually built my high voltage laboratory supply like that. I covered this in an older video, but th th this is quite large. I mean, if you need some sort of regulator for something like a vacuum tube headphone amplifier or some other application where you just need clean high voltage, you don't want to have a huge circuitry behind it. And this is where having integrated components would be really, really helpful. But the problem is that when you're working with voltages above a few hundred volts, you don't really have that many high voltage components. I mean, not even basic op amps are available. But that doesn't mean we can't resort to just a little bit of trickery. Now, one of the few linear regulators that also has a negative voltage version available is the LM317. And you also have the LM337. And now this component is a 40 volt regulator. So it's not really helpful. But if we look through the datasheet a bit, we find quite an interesting application an 160 volt regulator. So it is possible to take this component or any component like it and create a regulator that works well above its normal operating voltage. Let's look at the circuit in a bit more detail, see exactly how this works. So first off, if we analyze the basic LM317 regulator, well, we need a regulator, we got an input and output voltage, and then a voltage divider to set the output voltage. Now, regarding voltages, for correct operation of the circuit, we will need a 1.25 volt drop on the upper resistor, and then our 40 volt limit refers to the difference between input and output voltage. But it's important to mention that the regulator doesn't have any limit in reference to ground. So the datasheet is only telling us what voltages we need between the terminals, but not really where this voltage needs to be in reference to ground. This is why the LM317 is also called a floating regulator. So now if we go to a graph with voltages, as long as our output voltage is in within a 40 volt limit of the input voltage, it can be whatever value you want. So you can have an input voltage of 200, and as long as your output is above 160, you are safe. But there's one important period in the operation that needs to be mentioned. What happens when you first switch on the voltage? So right at the first moment when you turn on the input voltage, the input will shoot up to its 
nominal value, but because the output of the regulator usually has large capacitors, the output voltage will trail along a bit slower. So even though at nominal operating voltage you get within the 40 volt limit, right at the beginning you can have a much much larger voltage difference between input and output. So our regulator isn't really in its safe operating area. Now the other piece of circuit we need to look at is the basic thinner and transistor regulator. So this is a regulator that keeps the output voltage at 0.6 volts below the base voltage, so this is the voltage needed to polarize the transistor, and now the base voltage will either be the input voltage or some lower value depending on if the thinner diode is conducting. So if the thinner diode is conducting then this voltage will be stabilized at the thinner voltage and then the output will be slightly lower than that. Now it's worth mentioning that even though this regulator is extremely simple to build, it's not very precise. So your thinner voltage will be dependent on the current flowing through the thinner diode and the temperature of the diode, and also the base emitter voltage will again be current and temperature dependent. So this will be quite useful to stabilize the voltage to a rough area. It won't be exactly precise, so you can't get 5.00 volts out of this, but you can get somewhere between 4 and 6. Now it's important to mention that this thinner connection can be made to ground or to any other potential. So the transistor doesn't really care where you're getting your base voltage from, how you're stabilizing it. So now if we take the two circuits, this thing and the basic LM317 circuit and put them together, we get something really interesting. So what we get is a circuit that looks like this. We have our basic stabilizer at the beginning and then our LM317 stabilizer as a second stage. And what I've done is taking the thinner diode on the first stage and rather than reference it to ground, like in the basic schematic, you can reference it to the output voltage. So in effect, what the first transistor is doing is providing a voltage that is just a few volts above our output voltage. So depending on what the thinner diode value is, of course. But here, precision is not important. So if I take, say, a 10 volt thinner diode, then I'll get around 9 volts at the output. But this 9 volts is in reference to the output. So the 9 volts is exactly the voltage drop that the LM317 will see. So basically, no matter what the input voltage is at whatever time, the voltage that will drop on the 317 will be dictated by the first stabilizing stage. And this transistor will be the one that needs to take up all the high voltage. So if we would plot our stabilized voltage on our initial graph, it would look something like this. Both in the startup phase and then in steady state operation, our stabilized voltage will stay at our thinner voltage difference from the output, always keeping our LM317 in its safe operating range. And this means that this time our output voltage can have any value. So we no longer have our 40 volt limit in reference to the input because we need to keep it within 40 volts in reference of our stabilized voltage. So with this sort of arrangement, we can have any input voltage and any output voltage and keep our 317 safe. Now in theory, the circuit looks perfect. You also have the same thing in the datasheet with a few more extra components. But now let's look at how this works in the simulator. So I prepared the same circuit that we've seen before with a few minor modifications. On the one side, rather than using a bipolar transistor, I used the field effect transistor, a MOSFET. And the main reason for this being that you can find high voltage MOSFETs much more easily than high voltage bipolar transistors. And by high voltage, I mean above 4 or 500 volts. Second, as our base regulator, I use the LT317. This simulation model is already built into the simulator. And finally, I added a 20 milliamp load. So just so that the circuit has some sort of load to supply its voltage into. So if we run this thing, I'm applying a 0 to 300 volt ramp. And at the output, we see roughly 100 volts. So the whole system is taking up to 300 volts to supply only 100.
so 200 volts will be dropping on the circuit. Now if we look at the voltage dropping on our 317 and we just add an extra plot plane, we can see that this voltage stays below 3 volts. So our secondary stabilizer circuit is working perfectly. The LT317 will not see more than 3 volts with this configuration. So even though there's 200 volts dropping on the regulator, the 317 is safe. Now one of the things we can notice is that when the voltage is ramping down, because we have quite large capacitor on the output, some of the current will go back through the regulator. So we can see that the voltage drop on the regulator goes negative to about minus 1.2. And to protect the regulator from this effect, commonly you will add a diode between the output and the input. So something like this. Here I added D4 between output and input. And what this is doing is limiting the voltage drop, so the one we see here in cyan, to about 0.7. Now the next thing we need to address is that the voltage drop on the 317 is slightly oscillating. So th this isn't a good thing. And one of the things we can do about this is add a capacitor over the low side resistor. Something like this. And now by adding this capacitor, if we look on the voltage drop again, we can see that it now looks much much smoother, no more problems, everything's nice. But it's also important to mention that if we add this sort of capacitor, we should also add a diode between the adjust pin and the output pin, just so that this capacitor doesn't stay charged and then discharge through the 317. So again, a protection element. Another thing we can add at this point is a capacitor between the gate of the MOSFET and ground, basically turning it into a capacitance multiplier. So since we already have two stages of linear regulators, let's make them as good as possible. And this is basically how the final circuit should look like. If we check now the voltage drop on the 317, and we just remove these other two, we can already see that it's much much cleaner, we don't really have a lot of these jumps anymore, it's all much smoother thanks to the extra capacitor in the first transistor. So now just to see what sort of voltage drops we have on the circuit, I prepared this circuit with the mention that all my timings are now much much larger. So because of all the added capacitors, the circuit is working a bit slower, so we'll need a bit longer time to simulate it. So if we just run a longer 10 second simulation, we look at the same voltages as before, so you can see that the regulator is still regulating, it's all working correctly. But now if we look at what happens on the entire regulator, so the full voltage drop on it, we can see that at some point it does reach 200 volts and that's perfectly normal. So this is when the input is 300 and the output is 100. But more interestingly, during the period in which the whole regulator would be saturated, so you would have your minimum voltage drop on it, we only have around 8 volts. So these 8 volts are coming from the roughly 3 volts dropping on the 317 and then a few more volts needed to drive the field effect transistor. So it's minimum gate threshold voltage. So with this sort of arrangement we can get a minimum voltage drop on our regulator below 10 volts. So this will depend of course on the exact field effect transistor that is being used. So now just to make sure that everything's okay, let's also perform a frequency domain simulation on this circuit. And for that I took the same circuit that we had before and we'll run an AC simulation. So if we look at the output in reference to input, we can see that starting from 10 Hz up until 1 MHz, we have at least 40 decibels of attenuation everywhere, so it's a pretty good regulator. But we can also see exactly how much of this attenuation is coming from the first transistor, which is working as a capacitance multiplier, and how much from the LM317. So we can see that our first transistor is mostly effective at our lower frequencies, but then its effectiveness drops at higher frequencies. So the first thing we can do to try to improve the behavior is to add the capacitor right in between the two stages. 
So here I have the exact same circuit, but with the one microfarad capacitor added in between. Now if we look at the first transistor, we can see that its behavior is much better already at higher frequencies. And then we see the same improvement translated after the LM317. Now we can try to further improve the behavior of the circuit by increasing the values of the capacitors. So first of all, we can see what happens when we increase the capacitor attached to the 317. So here we have the exact same circuit as before, but this capacitor is now increased to one microfarad rather than 100 nanofarads. So this is our previous circuit. And now with the increase in the capacitor, we can see that our first stage hasn't changed a bit. So the response is exactly the same. But when we look at the output, we can see that it's behaving much better at low frequencies. So by increasing C6 in this case, we will have a better response at frequencies below a few kilohertz. Now, on the other hand, if we would increase the other capacitor, so with this circuit, only the capacitor in the first stage was increased, we can see that we have a far better improvement at higher frequencies. So somewhere between the one kilohertz and the hundred something kilohertz mark. And this of course translates also to the final output. So all in all, the circuit works pretty well. You can play around with the values of the capacitors and improve its behavior. If you really want to improve very high frequency behavior, one of the things you can try is also adding a ferrite bead into the gate of the field effect transistor. But all in all, the circuit works, at least in a simulator. The true test of it will be in practice. But that is a topic for next time. For now, hope you got some useful information after this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.